Hi everybody, welcome back to chapter two and the last couple of pages. We're gonna go straight into Sister Anne's arrival and then chapter three will be the new beginnings. So let's continue with one of the main characters that's now introduced to the boys at Linden Hall in Madame's home. And it's, she is called Sister Anne. Subtitled Sister Anne's arrival. The finish of chapter two. To Madame's great surprise, Father Peter arrived one day unannounced to Linden Hall. With him he brought a guest, a young nun of quiet disposition. This little woman was about 35 years of age and terribly shy. Father Peter introduced her to Madame as Sister Anne. She was to become a long-term friend to all in Linden Hall eventually. There was a purpose for Sister Anne's sudden arrival. Only now could Father Peter have put forward a long-term proposition to Madame. This proposition would give Madame an instant family, one she so desperately yearned for. It would involve Sister Anne and Madame supervising the rearing of five young boys. As it turned out, this resulted in my brothers and me coming to live with Madame. Without seeming too eager to please, Madame listened to Father Peter's story of how and when this was to happen. He explained that in the workhouse there were two children who were very special to him. He felt these children did not belong there, stating, They are dear to my heart. He requested that Madame looks after them in Linden Hall with the help of Sister Anne. Madame was almost delirious with inner happiness, the prospect of having children in her home. Father Peter had a number of conditions attached to this proposal, though. Firstly, the children must remain behind the walls of Linden Hall at all times. Under no circumstances were they ever to venture outside the estate's boundary. Secondly, the children must only play with each other. They must never have either verbal or physical contact with any of the employee's children. The children must always refer to Madame as Madame and never use her Christian name, Claudette. They could treat her as a mother figure, but must never refer to her as mother. The boys' names were to be changed. Any information concerning the boys had to be directed to Father Peter immediately. Lastly, if the first of the boys settled down nicely at Linden Hall, there was possibility that Madame could take on three additional boys, if she was able to handle the responsibility. Confidentiality was paramount where the boys were concerned, and Madame was not to disclose anything to anybody about these boys unless he authorised it personally. Following this conversation with Father Peter, Madame disclosed to Sister Anne her concern by stating, It will become like a prison to the boys. If this is the case, I think the boys would be better off staying in the workhouse or going back to wherever they came from. To Madame, Father Peter's conditions seemed most severe. She inquired from Father Peter why no girls were available for adoption. And Father Peter shrugged his shoulders and replied that all children who were special to him were boys. None had turned out to be girls. Madame reflected on his answer and found it very odd to say the least. However, she was so overjoyed by the prospect of being a foster mother that she didn't dwell on it too much. Father Peter assured her that the church would take care of all the children's financial needs, rewarding Madame for her own efforts with generous quarterly payments. Flattered by his comments, she found herself saying yes before she had a chance to change her mind. Father Peter handed Madame a contract to sign. This contract would allow the boys to stay at Linden Hall, governed by Madame until the church decided otherwise. Once she had signed the contract, Father Peter went away to bring these five young boys to her. To the best of my knowledge, it was because of this proposition and Madame's agreement to it that I eventually had come to live at Linden Hall. Chapter 3 New Beginnings Bust away from our birth mothers and taken to live in a new home with new identities, my brothers and I rebelled and became unsettled, just like any normal children would. Full of anger at our imprisonment, we fought and cried with each other. However, like all other children, we also became bored of doing this and, and became very frightened on our own. In time and over time, we learned to become friends and settle into the new life which had been chosen for us. Initially, there were a lot of new toys and a lot of things to distract and entertain us. And over a period of months, we forgot that we were come from 
other different backgrounds to be adopted into this new situation and surroundings. And as time passed, memories of our birth mothers faded and we fought each other for Madame's attention. Whilst Madame loved every minute of this, Sheila was busy trying to manage our tantrums, which ranged from regular outbursts of anger to mood swings and jealousy. Nevertheless, we managed over time to become quite a close unit. My newly acquired stepbrothers held me in high regard, mainly for being cheeky and outspoken. Father Peter, as predicted, called regularly throughout those early years. He spent time lecturing us about the outside world and what an evil place it could be to live in. He oversaw what the other priests gave to us to study and ensured that we worked and studied hard. We all became accustomed to the discipline he imposed on us, carrying out our daily routine without question. Our dislike of Father Peter increased when he whipped our brother Tom as an example for disobeying his orders. Tom's punishment for refusing to get up for school one morning, despite being unwell. Upon hearing this, Madame lost all sense of reason and decided to show Father Peter who was the boss. I remember the row as if it was only yesterday. I watched from underneath the table in the main dining room. There I witnessed Father Peter struck Madame across the face. She shouted, This is payment for your insolence at punishing my son, Tom, without my knowledge or consent, you bastard. And she struck back harder. Nevertheless, when she attempted to strike Father a second time, he grabbed her hand and shouted back that he would have us all taken away. Madame defied Father Peter, telling him that many years ago her father had invested some of her family wealth in stocks and shares through family members that lived in England. Soon she was going to gain the benefits of those investments. When that happened, Madame threatened that both Father Peter and the church would never dictate to her again because she would be in a strong position to have any legally binding agreement that she signed revoked in court. Madame also warned Father Peter to remember that her legally binding contract signed by the Archbishop himself was nearing its renegation date. She threatened that she would stop allowing the church to use the home to house his boys. Shocked by her newfound position, Father Peter stood for a while trying to absorb this information. Suddenly he turned to Madame and smiled, agreeing that he'd been a bit hasty and apologised for his actions. Madame ordered Father Peter out of her home, telling Fred, the estate's head gardener, to escort him to the main gates. From there, F Father Peter could find his own way home, she said. That particular incident was embarrassing for Father Peter, and at the same time a blessing in disguise for my brothers and me. As Madame made sure we'd never again we were going to be left unsupervised in his company. From then on, Fred began to act like a surrogate father, constantly watching out for my brothers and myself. Madame and Fred grew very close over the, the following years. She'd forgotten how to love, but continued to flirt with Fred nevertheless. He took this flirtation to mean that she felt the same way about him. Now and for now, they enjoyed each other's company and the chemistry they shared, which seemed to entertain them both in the long term. Fred became a victim of his one-way love affair. Initially, when Fred asked Madame to raise the special children he had in mind, she readily agreed. This may have been because she felt having children around would fill the void in her life, left by the death of her parents and the betrayal of a loved one. Whatever the reason, she knew agreeing to his demands meant that this was the only way to rebuild Linden Hall, which had fallen into disrepair. Over the years, everything of value was sold to try and meet the day-to-day -day running costs of Linden Hall. Now, slowly but surely, Madame had begun to prosper again, thanks mainly to the church payments. However, she knew that soon her prosperity would rise even again from the imminent dividend payments due from her father's investments. At last, she felt empowered by the real possibility that Linden Hall would be completely hers once more. Over the coming years, however, Madame's newfound wealth led to greed as she searched for more ways to earn money. Thus her persona, as a kind and loving person, began to come into question. Although Madame came across as having a love-hate relationship with this parish priest, he was repeatedly able to win her approval on various matters of importance. And after continued requests from Father Peter, she decided to employ older boys from the workhouse 
and girls from the convents run by the Sisters of Charity. The church contributed to the cost of maintaining a home, whilst the children did all the work very cheaply. Father Peter informed Madame that the Archbishop had given him control of the entire workhouse and Linden Hall, and privately the Archbishop had reiterated the fact that Madame was not to be put under any pressure or intimidated at any stage by himself. He also emphasised that she would continue to make any final decisions regarding the running of Linden Hall, as if it was still her own home. Father Peter reluctantly agreed and handed Madame another signed contract to this effect, which she then put away for safekeeping. Madame never discussed with anyone where she kept this contract. However, on a few occasions when she drank whiskey, she let it slip that it was in a safe place in the dining room. Madame never trusted Father Peter and knew she would never do that. Putting these feelings aside though, she had to credit the church for the massive role it played in saving her home from falling into rack and ruin. From the beginning, she watched as the boys from the workhouse rebuilt her home. For many years, she felt guilty because of this child labor. And although she was restoring this house out of love, she knew that the efforts and the sweat of these boys were not the same of love. They were due to instructions from Father Peter. Only she and the church would benefit from the pain of their efforts. She also knew that these boys received nothing in return, not even a word of thanks. It was strange for, for me to watch Madame accepting their suffering and state publicly that she accepted their labour as a gift from God, her God. Soon after the completion of the work, Linden Hall began to gain a reputation. It became a successful bed and breakfast, renowned for excellent accommodation and mouth-watering cuisine. Notoriety followed each shooting, shooting season, and any pheasants killed in the day was eaten that evening. Gentry from throughout the country arrived at Linden Hall seeking fun and relaxation. They also embraced the warmth and hospitality bestowed on them by Madame, and Madame's personal income and that of the church increased annually thanks to her grace and charm and the schemes of Father Peter. Years later, one of Father Peter's schemes would shock the neighbouring village of Glendora. For now, Father Peter surprised Madame by announcing that he would be visiting with the, with the Archbishop himself. My brothers and I now ranged from eight years of age to ten, respectively. She was about to meet the man who had turned her whole life around so long ago. Madame became very nervous and tetchy, probably due to the amount of alcohol she had consumed. And her wealth grew, and so did her dependency on drink, feeling that as a weak person, alcohol helped her to always get through the day. In reality, the opposite was true. Alcohol prevented her from making rational decisions. I had my own suspicions as to why her dependence on alcohol had increased. To me, she was trying to hide a guilty conscience. Though what that guilt was, I didn't know. And I was not going to find out any time soon. I simply went along with things as they were, without creating any fuss or asking any awkward questions. When we heard the Archbishop was coming to visit, my brothers and I went upstairs to sort of clothes out to wear. My gut feeling told me not to be, and not to bring unwarranted attention regarding this impending visit. Instead, I promised myself I would act normally. Next, Madame appeared at our room door, followed by her own staff and some new faces. These newcomers had arrived from the convent and our neighbouring homes. During their employment at Linden Hall, they were warned what they should do and not do, and never become complacent or lax in her company, or they would be immediately sacked. Once Sheila took over, familiarising themselves herself and them with the house, they were also informed, these new staff, not to have any verbal or eye contact with my brothers and I whatsoever. Madame then noticed Fred was standing patiently downstairs and immediately invited him inside for a drink. Fred began inquiring how she wanted the gardens to be presented, and linking him seductively into her arms, she led him back outside and around the gardens as he admired the gladioli, narcissi, roses and all the other plants which made the grounds so beautiful. Madame told Fred that she only knew that only he knew what to do in the garden and that she would never contemplate interfering with his work. She also said that she did not need to ask, he did not need to ask her advice for anything. She'd always been happy with his efforts. In return, Fred assured her that everything would be looking its best for the arrival of the Archbishop. He'd make sure of it himself. Over the coming days, Madame felt 
she needed to oversee the forthcoming visit. The house became a flurry of activity. The kitchen maid scrubbed and cleaned everything in the room and the parlours, whilst the other servants cleaned out all the spare guest rooms one by one. Some of the butlers began organising the cleaning of all the silverware, and the other staff ensured that their uniforms were kept immaculate. There was mayhem throughout Linden Hall. Even poor old Fred was in a tizzy. The only thing that kept him sane under such pressure was his smoking. However, I believe that our sanity would once again prevail when this domain visit was over. Although Madame, Madame was gentle by nature, she was an extremely hard taskmaster. This derived from her father, who had been a perfectionist, because her mother had born him, never borne him a son. Madame always felt pressurised to please him, as best she could by following in his footsteps. With the skills she, with the skills she had acquired and inherited, there was no way she was going to let the unopportunist, like Father Peter, find fault with anything. On completion of everybody's work, Madame huffed and puffed and argued with many of the staff that their work was not up to scratch. I noticed that the poor Catholic vi villagers employed by Madame had taken to wearing rosary beads and crucifixes of every description. Maybe they were all going to chant the conifer on the arrival of the Archbishop. Like my brothers, I wandered aimlessly around the house when we could. Nellie and I met and had a quiet cigarette. The only slight imperfection I noticed was the aroma of cooked pheasant waffling through the house. I hated the smell. Madame fixed this, ordering fresh rose petals to be scattered on the tile floors before the Archbishop arrived. On one of my walkabouts, I noticed Lucy, the parlourmaid, working hard outside the courtyard. She was scrubbing sheets on a wooden washboard. This was seriously hard work, and Lucy had been born out of wedlock and was given to the convent in the hope that she would become a nun. Lucy saw this as her mother's way of easing her own conscience after handing Lucy over to the convent. When asked if she herself would ever consider giving her child away, she was horrified and replied, May? Bloody? May? Are you serious? Not bloody likely. No, I want to be a mother and rear my own kids properly. I want a home and two children whom I can look after and give all the love in the world to. It worried me that so many children from the workhouses and convents longed to have their own children as soon as possible. No doubt in the vain hope that it would substitute for the love they themselves had never known. I felt this would just make for a generation of loveless children. Therefore, I always questioned how they would give love when they never experienced it. Surely their own children would grow up troubled, feeling emotionless from parents, tired of trying to give what they never had received themselves. How do you teach what you have never learned? Thankfully, my only experience with the workers was a visit I made at Madame's request to accompany Fred and Sheila on one of their charity runs. The particular workhouse which I regarded and which I visited often was called the Maze. That was where the other boys in the van were taken to on the first day I arrived at Linden Hall. I heard the children there had a very harsh upbringing, making them cynical and depressed teenagers and then adults as a result. They never saw the outside world. For many, their only hope was adoption. Many potential parents wanting to adopt children from the workhouse rejected them for the simplest of things. For example, if the prospective parents offered a girl instead of a boy, or the child had black hair and the prospective parents wanted a blonde-haired child, these simple rejections had harrowing, harrowing results for the children. I heard that once any of the potential adopted parents rejected a child, that child would re return to the workhouse feeling suicidal. Some of the priests whose jobs were to monitor the workhouse were known to prey sexually on these vulnerable children. Over time, those children who grew up in the workhouse became weary of people calling in to offer any acts of kindness or love. For example, Fred regularly dropped off clothes collected for the, for the children by Madame. Sheila also delivered vegetables that she had picked fresh from her own garden. However, the priests kept everything for themselves and gave nothing to the children. Upon hearing about this, Madame rebelled by defying Father Peter's insistence on keeping us under lock and key, and allowed me, both myself and I to accompany Fred and Sheila to the maze workhouse as a result. On one such trip, I did get speaking to one of the older boys who lived there. He recognised me from my first trip to Linden Hall. He told me I was lucky, 
and inform me of the hardships within the workhouse, the daily routines, plus the punishments and the sexual abuse which took place at night time there. After this I began to rebel by skipping choir practice and of any kind church meetings when the priest gave their talks about life at Linden Hall. Madame encouraged the priest to teach us about life in general and the world that we lived in. I was so angry at their hypocrisy. How could those who ruin the lives of so many innocent children teach my brothers and I the morals of living a good life in the outside world? This may explain my subsequent distrust of anybody representing the church and my disinterest in the Archbishop's forthcoming arrival. However, I began to prepare myself the best I could for the first real encounter with the man who snatched me away from my paternal mother, Father Peter. Chapter four next in my next video is Father Peter and the reintroduction to one of the main and biggest characters of the trilogy. I hope you'll join me.